Lucas, we get to, so now we're talking about the middle of the fourth century, we get to what is now going to be another vast empire, which is really going to be the last great Hindu empire, at least in North India. And then in Vijayanagar, you'll have, you know, in South India, you'll have the Vijayanagar empire, but that's a thousand plus years later, thousand years plus later, right? And, and that really is a South Indian, it's in the Deccan, it's a South Indian empire. The Vijayanagar empire never extends up to the north. So that is one reason why I've, I've suggested to you uh, why the Guptas become quite important in the Indian imagination, particularly in the Hindu imagination, you know. Okay, so the Guptas used to be called uh, uh, the the Gupta period used to be called the golden age of India. And this is the verdict of many historians. Uh, I have a little quotation here from A.L. Pasham, whom we have encountered before, uh, who wrote this book. Very, very readable, although it has its problems, as I pointed out on a number of occasions, but, but extremely readable in many ways. The Wonder That Was India, published first published in 1954. And he says, in the best days of the Gupta Empire, Indian culture reached a perfection, which it was never again to attain. Now, see, so look at the verdict, that this was the height of it, okay? And remember always that the idea of the golden age is an idea that only works in the dialectical sphere, by which I mean, it is only in retrospect that we think of it as the golden age. And usually we think of it as a golden age in retrospect, centuries later often, when decay has set in. Because the golden age has no meaning unless we also have some notion of decay. That there was a decay, India fell into a state of disrepair, disrepute, disarray. You know, the prefix dis is so useful here, right? This was, this was an estimate that, that people reached centuries, centuries later, certainly in, certainly in the colonial period. And then, and then, and that's when people began to look back and say, ah, there must have been a time when things were really very good. Because where is this template really taken from? It's really taken again, once again, from European history. Because for Europe, what happened? Europe fell into the dark ages, right? And so then Europe had to say, well, we had a golden age. What was the golden age for Europe? No European thinker ever had even had to think for more than a minute to come up with the answer to that question. It was the Greeks. It was Plato, Aristotle, the great Greek uh, 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 writers, writers of tragedies, uh, Sophocles, Euripides, uh, and then the comic writer Aristophanes, right? Uh, the historian Thucydides, so, and so on. That this was the golden age. So, and I'm suggesting to you that when people uh, began to refer to the Guptas as the golden period, the golden period, it was unquestionably the European experience that they had in mind, I would say. And, and A.L. Basham himself is actually very much echoing the view of many colonial, colonial era historians who took this view that the Guptas were the golden age. So, and he continues that this time India was perhaps the happiest and most civilized region of the world. And of course, we could ask, well, what does it mean to be happy? What does it mean for a civilization to be happy? For the effete, effete Roman Empire, so effete is, is again an instructive word here, because it's not simply that the Romans had crumbled, but they had given, given into luxury and decay. And the men had become like women, they had become effeminate. They were no longer manly and masculine. Right? Mm -hmm. It was all indulgence. At this time, India was perhaps the happiest and most civilized region of the world for the effete Roman empire was nearing its destruction. And China was passing through a time of troubles between the two great periods of the Hans and the Tanks. And, and the comparison here is also not just with the great Romans, but with the Chinese, because China is the other great, in addition to India, it is the other great continuing civilization in the world. You know, modern, modern European civilization can look back to Greece, but 
and, and think of the Greeks, but that was almost uh, a period that uh, can be rendered as discrete. That is that nothing of that Greek culture really in a sense is passed down in some, one could say in some ways, right? It's like the epics that we were discussing, that you can't, you can't go around in Greece expecting people to know the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, as, as you can in India, that you can expect people to know the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So it's a continuing civilization in the case of India, as is the case with China, which is why Bhashram is making the comparison with China. But I start with this quotation here because we would have to ask ourselves, how do we come to a real assessment of this empire? Do we simply take the view that this is a colonial assessment? Uh, but, but if it is a colonial assessment, well, the British colonizer and then, and then more modern European scholars are saying, well, India did have a glorious period and it was this period. So, so some Indians might say to themselves with great pride, well, we had this period, but how do we really assess it, right? Uh, because of course, uh, do we then just accept only those opinions of European scholars which are favorable to us and dismiss everything else, right? That would be the logical question that I would ask to people who say, well, we should accept this assessment for what it is, right? Because we know that the bulk of the European assessment of India was that India was a country that was stagnant and it decayed uh, for centuries uh, and that it had nothing to contribute to world civilization any longer. I mean, I haven't given you quotations from 19th century European writers. If I started giving them to you, you'd know to what extent the British just developed a complete contempt for India while they were ruling the country in the 19th century, right? So, uh, so this is a problem for those who would like to say, well, we should accept, you know, uh, those verdicts which are favorable to us and ignore the rest. And, mm. um, uh, I've discussed already the politics of this characterization. That is, where is it coming from? What time is it coming? What is the role of the colonial historians? Uh, and suggested to you that there is a European template. All right. But I want to reinforce the idea that it, that this idea of a golden age is only an idea that resonates with us if we assume that there were obviously periods of sharp decay. And then the juxtaposition, the comparison, the contrast, all of this becomes far more clear, all right? And when we do say, even if we accept the terms of that characterization, then do we say that the achievements of this age were without equal in the rest of Indian history, right? Um, one, of the, one of the great Gupta emperors, the one under whom the empire reached, uh, acquired, the one under whom the empire became the largest uh, in the Gupta period, Samudra Gupta, uh, was referred to by a British historian of the 20th century. So Vincent A. Smith is writing uh, in uh, the early part, in the first half of the 20th century. Okay, um, and in fact, his, you know, when Penguin did a two-volume history of India 50 years ago. Um, and the ancient period was covered by Romila Thapar and the modern period was covered by Vincent A. Smith. Uh, so Vincent A. Smith, you know, has been writing, had been writing already for some decades at that point. He's really active in the 30s, 40s, 50s. He calls Samudra Gupta the Napoleon of India, right? And then again, you have to say, well, what does that really mean? Of course, he, he means to say that Samudra Gupta occupied the same place in Indian history that Napoleon did in um, Western history. Uh, of course, we have to ask, why is it that um, Napoleon is not called the Samudra Gupta of France, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always, the comparison is always goes that way, right? That, that uh, Calcutta is the Venice of, Venice of India, Samudra Gupta is the Napoleon of India, uh, you know, Mohandas Gandhi is the Christ of India. Uh, well, you know, why, why, don't we, why don't we reverse this? So you see, even there, the template, the idea is that you take the template from Europe and then you see to what extent you can fit India uh, into that mold. And this is a larger problem with which we started two months ago. 
and that is how do ideas get transferred from one domain to another? How do metaphors get transferred from one domain to another? Uh, and what kind of periodization is involved in the idea of the golden age? So that periodization, of course, is uh, ancient, medieval, and modern. And golden ages usually, by the way, are, are all in the in the ancient period because then you get the medieval period, and that's the dark ages, right? It's uh, which I have already questioned a number of times quite seriously. Uh, but it's no accident that just as Greece, and then we're talking about ancient Greece, was the golden age for for modern Europe uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, there, similarly, it is ancient India, and particularly the Guptas, uh, who then become the golden age, you know, for those who are looking at India, right? The, it's an ancient period. So this is this is what I mean by the politics of periodization and the politics of trying to understand what we mean by the notion of a golden age. Uh, and of course, needless to say, I'm simplifying here because uh, golden is also, as an illustration, synonymous with, with the classic Okay, so we think of the Greeks as the classic uh, writers uh, from Western civilization. They produce the classics as well. Just as we say that uh, the golden age gave us the classical playwright of India, that's Kalidas, we'll turn to him later on. Uh, and then of course, we'd have to say, well, what do we mean by classic? What is the real meaning of that word? Uh, sometimes we also use the phrase, you've heard it many times, it's a modern classic, right? So if you look at, if you look, let's say at a very good film that's been highly influential, you say it's a modern classic, but the word classic is actually in many ways synonymous with ancient. So, so you, there, there, that's where the complexity is that, that we, can, we can say that golden has to be interpreted uh, in a wide variety of ways. And that's not what we're going to do today because that would be a discussion really on the politics entirely of what we mean by classicism, golden, um, uh, and sometimes even traditional because what is classical is also sometimes viewed as traditional, you know, all right. One last cons consideration before we move to more concrete matter, which is that I think that one reason why the Guptas um, have become very important in the reconstruction of the Indian past is because uh, the concern with the unity of India uh, persists to the present day. Uh, the, the idea of the unity of India is invoked by politicians, it's invoked by the present prime minister, it's been invoked by every prime minister before. Uh, one of the reasons why why a country like India, indeed any nation state, is so protective of its borders and uses that as a pretext to keep out various people is because it is assumed that the idea of the unity of the country is central to the dignity and integrity of the nation. Uh, and, in the, and, and in the case of Indian history, one of the constant problems we are encountering uh, is how do we construe this idea of unity? Uh, there are so many difficulties in construing this idea of unity. The fundamental difficulty is that there is perhaps no place in the world which is, which is as uh, pluralistic as India is. Right? When you have a thousand languages, when you have a country which is the home to more than half of the world's religions, that is, it was half the world's religions were born in India. You know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. And then, and then you're saying that the Zoroastrianism, now India is a main place where it survives because it was driven out of Iran. There's a Jewish population in India, which has a history that goes back to 2000 years. And Christianity has a history that goes back to 2000 years in India, 2000 years. One of, one of Christ's disciples is alleged to have come to India as early as about the year 75 in the common era. That's 2000 years almost, right? And, in, and, and although Islam is not born in India, that, that for many years, India had the world's second largest population of Muslims 
before Pakistan edged out India very recently. Now India is the third largest population of Muslims. And of course, remember that in undivided India, India had by far the largest population of Muslims in the world, by far. Even today, many people forget, you know, when American scholars work on Islam, one of the fundamental problems of their work on Islam is that they really take the Middle East to be the place that is synonymous with Islam. But if you're looking at the world's largest Muslim populations, the four largest Muslim countries in the world are not in the Middle East. The largest Muslim population of the world is Indonesia, then Pakistan, and just a couple of million more than India, and then the fourth is Bangladesh. This is these are the largest Muslim populations of the world. Of course, India is not a Muslim majority country, but the other three are Muslim majority countries. Right? So you know the diversity is 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 without parallel, without parallel. And then of course, it's also been the foreign element in Indian history for a very long period of time. Who is a foreigner? right what makes an indian an indian i mean when you consider the aryans well they're coming from abroad they're coming from from as we saw from central asia and from from the caucasus mountains that region over there someplace right they're coming there then we have the greeks coming in and then of course india is going to fall and they're going to be central number of central asian dynasties uh, the the Lodi Gardens, which we had talked about before. Well, who are the Lodis, right? And these are people who are Afghans. And so we have a considerable Afghan presence in Indian history. Uh, and then India is going to fall under Muslim rule for centuries and under British rule. Uh, there's Dutch influence, there's Portuguese influence. So this is one reason why for many Indians, particularly modern day Indians, who have come to believe that, that India will never exercise real influence in the world until it stays unified. That India has to present a unified figure to the rest of the world. And I think that's one reason why the crackdown in India is even more intense. Uh, it's not just the Hindu project, that, that's certainly a part of it. But it's also this idea that we can't afford to have dissenters because India is a very delicate place. It's very fragile. There are just too many different kinds of communities and groups there, and it's susceptible to influences from abroad. So, so all of this also has implications for studying the Guptas because the Guptas began to be viewed as a kingdom, a set of rulers who provided a certain kind of unity and coherence to the idea of India, all right? That's the broad framework. Now, what's the chronology of the Guptas? There's some uncertainty about their chronology. Um, and we have to understand that the main material for studying the Guptas is numismatic and epigraphic material, not texts really. So, uh, so epigraphs, of course, epigraphic material can be considered text, but I don't, but, but I, by that I mean, we're not really talking about long histories. What we're talking about is inscriptions. That's what these epigraphs are. They're really inscriptions. The inscriptions uh, could be in a number of different places, including temple walls. Um, they might be recorded in various places. And then numismatic material is coins, because we do have a huge number of coins that are from the Gupta period, and many of these coins are uh, in very good condition, uh, gold in, uh, gold coins, uh, and the work on these coins is very superior. So it's possible to make quite a lot of inferences about who the Guptas are uh, or what they did uh, and, and make some inferences about the character of the Guptas. So some doubts remain about their exact origins, as I've said, and their chronology. Uh, I think the earlier generation of historians all agreed that the Guptas are Vaishyas. So if you look at the if you look at people who are called Guptas in India today, um, uh, it, it's a very common very common caste name. Uh, the Guptas are really Vaishyas. You know, these are people who are uh, people who um, you know traditionally would have been involved uh, in in uh, you know shopkeeping uh, merchants. They would have been merchants, mercantile traders, 
uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but there are some historians who suggest that it may have been a Brahmin caste. They're certainly not Kshatriyas though. They're not Kshatriyas. And, and I would just like to remind you at this juncture what I said uh, in a previous lecture, that it is striking that, that for hundreds of years, there are no Kshatriya dynasties really uh, in India around this time before that and in, for some centuries to come. Their traditional chronology is basically 319, 320 to 550. Okay, um, so that's when it begins. The early history goes back, as I said here, to 270. Um, so, and when we say early history, we're saying it's more fragmentary. We don't know much about the people who might have birthed this empire. Uh, and if they did, they were, they were kings among many others. You know, they were not singular in the way in which the later Guptas are going to become singular. That is that their, their majesty is such partially because of the expanse of the empire and because of the achievements that they have a singularity in the historical record. So that therefore the traditional chronology really focuses on 320 to 550. And we can actually say that the high period is 320 to 467. So to round it out, we're talking about 150 years. That's how long this empire lasted. Um, you know, you think of the British in India, the British first established control in 1757 in Eastern India. Uh, and 1947, the British uh, have to quit India. So that's 190 years. And remember that 1757, when they established control, that was only in parts of North, uh, part, parts of Eastern India. And, and you know, uh, the, in what could be called the province of Bengal. Uh, Bengal in those days in the 18th century did not mean what it means today. It would have included large parts uh, for example, of what are what is now called Bihar, uh, and even some portions, let's say, of uh, Orissa. Okay, but the point, nonetheless, is that effectively the British rule lasted India for as long as the Guptas did, for about 150 years. The Mughals, uh, you know, if you're looking at really the high period again, you're talking about 250 years. So this this is this is not atypical. You know, you, you get dynasties that are going to rule for 150, 200, 300 years, effectively. And there are five principal monarchs, uh, Chandragupta the first. Uh, these years that are given in parentheses, these are the years when the person reigned, not, not the lifespan of the individual, but the years when the person was monarch. So 390 to 335. And then on his death, it's going to be his son, Samudra Gupta, 335 to 375, then Chandra Gupta II, 380 to 415. Uh, you notice there's a little gap there of five years between 375, 380. That's because sometimes you get these uh, problems in succession. Uh, it can be contested. Uh, and then you have Kumara Gupta, 415 to 455. And finally, Skanda Gupta, 455 to 467. Uh, and we'll we'll see obviously in the course of this uh, course of this lecture what led to the demise uh, of the Guptas and why it began to crumble. All right. So the principal sources for the study of the Gupta period, as I said, epigraphic uh, evidence, which would include inscriptions on temple walls, uh, inscription uh, Samudra Gupta's inscription on the Ashokan pillar. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, because it's really quite extraordinary what's really going on there. Uh, and then numismatics, which are these gold coins, which are issued by the Gupta emperors. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to think about how coins might be used to make inferences about the status of the, uh, of the economy. Uh, so generally, for example, you find that uh, empires are doing well, or you have a very powerful monarch, you find that there's more prolific coinage, uh, the coins might be better in quality. Uh, you, uh, it's possible that the gold content is, is much higher. Uh, th then you can look at the relationship between gold coins and uh, coins or specie as it's called in other material, which would include silver and copper. Uh, and to what extent coins were the principal mode uh, of, 
of exchange in the economy? Uh, you know, were all transactions made with coinage or were they also made with goods? Did a system of barter exist to some degree as well? All right. So that's, that's the field of numismatics. Um, and we find that in the case of the Guptas that there is a precedence in India for, for very, very good gold coins. And these are coins from the Kushans. So this, the Kushans, remember, we're talking about the first century of the common era. Uh, and and uh, 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 there's, we have a, a, you know, a fair bit of very good coinage from the Kushan period. Uh, under Chandragupta II, you also have silver coins. Uh, and then under Skanda Gupta, we noticed that the gold coin, gold content was diminished, but the weight remained constant, you know. So it says, it's also there's a question about what's the degree of consistency uh, in the coins. You know, if they're completely uneven uh, and a hundred coins all differ from each other in terms of weight and the precision with which they're made, then you think to yourself that, well, actually there wasn't enough of a, a precise, if I may put it this way, science of how to use uh, make, manufacture these coins. Um, cowrie shells were also used. We have evidence from some texts which seems to suggest that. Then the sources include the law books, so Mano uh, because remember that, as I said, it came into place really about the second century, but, but there's still material that's being um, added on, and some historians have argued that it's really the fourth century, it's really the book, the period when this text uh, becomes uh, uh, you know, uh, begins, takes a shape that it would have uh, uh, for centuries to come thereafter. Uh, but there are also other law books. The Yajna Valkya Smriti is, is a key example of that, that were it used at that time. And we can make some inferences about uh, social structure, the nature of social relationships in India at that time. You have literary sources, including the plays of Kalidas, who is viewed as the most prominent playwright uh, to have come out of India. Um, and we have the records of travelers. In, in particular, we have the record of a traveler coming from China by the name of Fahin. It was a, he's, and when I say pilgrims, I say that word deliberately because these travelers also saw themselves as pilgrims. And why were they pilgrims? Because they were coming to the, the land that had given birth to the Buddha. So these, these are people who, have, uh, who are following Buddhism and in many ways they are anticipating the kind of religious pilgrimage uh, which has become much more familiar to us from more recent centuries. Uh, you know, when, when religious pilgrims go to a place associated with the founder of a, uh, founder of a religion. All right, so these are the main sources for the study of the Gupta period. Uh, here we have some maps here. Uh, so just so that you have a sense of what we're really speaking about. So if you look here, this portion here is the conquest of Chandragupta. So that's the, the person whom you can describe really as the founder of the empire, right? Uh, and, then, and then Samudra Gupta adds all of this portion here in, in light purple. To the, to the empire. So it was really under Samudra Gupta that the expansion of the empire was most considerable. Uh, and then this little portion here in blue is the portion that is added by Chandragupta II, uh, who was going to succeed Samudra Gupta. But notice the large expanse of Greek here, uh, green here, because this is all kingdoms which, have, which the Guptas are not able to, not able to conquer. Uh, uh, the Vakatakas, the Katamba, the Cholas. The Cholas are very important, even much later on in Indian history. So it's important to see them this, this active, and they're actually active even earlier than what this map is showing, because this map is showing what happens to India beginning the fourth century when the Guptas start to exercise hegemony. But the Cholas had been active since the beginning of the common era, uh, I mentioned them because they are the only um, power in India that really were a naval power before the, before the coming of the Europeans. Not, you have to remember that all these empires that we've been looking at in India, 
when you're looking at the Mauryan Empire, then we're looking when we're looking at uh, the Kushans, and now we're looking at uh, and and Harsha, and then when we're looking at the Guptas here, we're talking about land-based empires, land empires. But the Cholas had a, had a considerable naval presence, and of course, given 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 that they given that these this is a South Indian power, a peninsular power. So this the Indian Peninsula here. It stands to reason that that there would be a naval power as well, because if you're able to command the coastline, that obviously gives you a huge number of advantages. Uh, the Mughals had a navy, but it was very very small, and almost inconsequential. And and that's one significant change in Indian history with the coming of the Europeans. Is it's the beginning of what you might call the naval period in Indian history. The naval period in Indian history. That you have an, a maritime power now, uh, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and then the English, because it was really the ability of the Europeans to command the seas. So if you're if you're if you're looking at the 15th century, the 16th, 15th, 16th century, and why is it that the Europeans were able to make incursions into India? And that is because naval power had become the predominant form of power. It would have been impossible for Europe to have dominated the world unless they commanded the seas. They controlled the seas, which is what they did. And that is one reason why India is going to become vulnerable because the Portuguese, the English, the Dutch, they're all arriving by sea, you see? And I'm only mentioning it in this context here because we're looking at the Cholas here very briefly and saying, well, who are the Cholas and what is their importance? All right. So this is what this is what India looked like at this um, at the time of the Guptas. Uh, here's a somewhat more detailed map, uh, but this map has other uses as well, which I'm going to explain in a moment because it gives us greater insight into the into the political political structure of the Gupta Empire and and the particular way in which they sought to govern uh, the territories that they absorbed into the, uh, into the empire. So if you look at the key over here, it says the core area under Chandragupta, this is the core area over here. Uh, <coughs> and you notice that there, that you notice over here, the Lichavis. So the Lichavis uh, were a important clan uh, in, in Nepal. Uh, they, their name had surfaced during our discussion of Buddhism uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the Guptas are going to going to secure this northern part here by seeking a marriage alliance. Uh, it is always worthwhile thinking about marriage alliances because historically that's one of the ways in which in which uh, power is enhanced. Uh, wealthy people tend to marry other wealthy people. Uh, uh, men seeking power will often tend to marry wealthy women because that wealth is then absorbed into their own wealth. All right, uh, and marriage alliances were conducted uh, not just in India but all over the world, seeking this in mind, because when two people's wealth is accumulated put together, it obviously constitutes a greater force, right? Uh, you know the whole phenomenon which you find in India today as well. Uh, you know power couples as they're called, right? So that that's the whole principle here. That's what the Guptas were did was the the, the Gupta, one of the Gupta monarchs. Uh, is going to seek alliances with the uh, with the Lichavis, uh, with the women of the Lichavi family, and then and then once this marriage alliance is sealed, uh, it's a way of securing yourself more territory and strengthening your borders. But this is the core area that we're talking about. Um, the empire. This is this is the area that is synonymous with more or less with what for some centuries now had been called Magadha because the Mauryan Empire was based in Magadha as well. So this is what this area is, Magadha. This is really the, where they're based. Uh, and within that, some of the main cities would be uh, Patliputra. Patliputra is modern day Patna, right? Uh, and Prayag, which is Allahabad. Uh, now, it's, now it's gone back to being called Prayag uh, a couple of years ago because that was one of the changes instituted by, by Modi and Amit Shah. Uh, and then you have the city of Ayodhya, right? Uh, and this, remember, Kanaj was was important historically, as we saw before. And and then and then you get Mathura, which of course is still there, 
city uh, associated with the legends of Krishna, uh, among others. And then, of course, the city of Varanasi, uh, also, in, also known uh, as Kashi, the city of light, and more popularly as Banaras. Right, so uh, it's called Varanasi. I don't know if you know that, but it's called Varanasi because it's a distance between the the two ghats, the ghat of Varuna and the ghat of Asi. So that's that was the traditional city, the what was the traditional city of Varanasi, uh, uh, but also known as Kashi, the city of light. Uh, so uh, this is Magadha. This is the core area of the Guptas, and then these are what are called. If the key here says border. Kings under Samudra Gupta. So Samudra Gupta absorbs these areas. Uh, I will explain to you in just a moment uh, what, what is meant by border kings. Uh, and then uh, the arrows here show the southern campaigns uh, of Samudra Gupta that this is, so he sets out from here and this is the campaign that he conducts and this is an attempt to annex uh, some of the, the territory uh, which if you just go back here to this map over here, right? So you can see that it comes down all the way over here uh, 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 to, uh, you know, let's say, let's say around Chennai, you know, along, the, but on the coast here. And, and then you see uh, um, uh, that this arrow signifies the, the route uh, that, that he took. So, uh, and then this area here, which is in this, this uh, uh, you know, grid here, the light grid, which you see over here, you see the grid over here on this map here, this grid signifies the nominally conquered forest tribes. So by that, what, what the map maker means is that these, these, these are tribal populations. These are tribal populations. Forest tribes means the Adivasis, all right? So these are people who are not really living in cities. Um, and, and these are people who are largely Adivasis and they would also have belonged largely to different linguistic groups. Uh, so nominally conquered means that, that Samudra Gupta realized that, look, you don't want to get into an internal war with these tribal communities. They're very protective of their land. Uh, everyone is protective of their land, but they're more protective of the land because that's all they have. And that's true of Aboriginal populations and tribal populations all over the world, they have a very special relationship to the land. And the land is not something that you can alienate. Alienate here means sell. It's not something that you can just sell, you know, because you and I live in a modern economy where, where, where in this modern economy, land is just another thing that you, that you sell it. You put it on the marketplace and you have realtors and, and you make profit from it and you develop the land and so on. Uh, it, it has no sacred meaning as it does for these for people who are Adivasis, you know? And, and one of these days, if we ever resume this, uh, it would be really worthwhile looking at the whole uh, tribal cultures of India, which are enormously rich and about which we know very little. Uh, and, and you know, what their conception of life was, because it's a very, very bad mistake as which I think educated Indians do all the time to assume that tribal people are just simply people who are uneducated and backward. Uh, well, these are sometimes choices that people make about whether they want to enter into the modern world and if they do so on what terms they want to enter into it, you know? Uh, so Samudra Gupta, I'm suggesting to you, came to the realization that, you know, you don't want trouble from them, but, th uh, but at the same time, you want to, you, want to uh, uh, you know, keep them under control, okay, to some degree. So this is nominally conquered that, you know, in a sense, you exercise your, your control by simply suggesting to them, to these people that, look, these are the benefits of not giving us any trouble and we leave you alone and you are not going to be hospital to, hospital to my enemies because what would an enemy typically do? An enemy might retreat into someone else's territory to seek refuge. It's like a person going into exile today. So these nominally conquered forest tribes are expected to collaborate with the with the Guptas, with the conqueror, uh, but did not have to pay tribute, right? So tribute is a sum of money that, that, that a person who's been conquered, a king who's been conquered, a ruler who's been conquered pays to, pays to the emperor, to the, uh, uh, to the Guptas in this case, all right? Uh, and uh, sometimes what they did was they would actually leave certain areas unconquered because it was, again, 
and their interest not to rule these areas directly. So the Vakatakas is a dynasty which is allied with the Guptas but has its own autonomy to a very substantial degree. Now, what they did, what the Guptas did, I mean, I, I have another slide which, which sort of discusses that, but, but what they did effectively was they controlled, they, they had this system whereby they created buffer zones. So you see, in a sense, um, if you look at this, so this is the core area over here, this is the core area over here. So these are the border kings. Now, what does it mean, border kings? means that the emperor has decided that the acquisition of these areas and their absorption into the empire is useful and is required, all right? But in a sense, it would be useful to preserve a border because beyond this, beyond this, once you move into this area, beyond this, these are areas that are going to be hard to be able to govern over a period of time. Because the further away you are from the center, remember this is the center over here, Patliputra over here, all right? This is the core area. The further away you are from the center, the harder it is to control what is happening when you start to move to the extremities, all right? And, and, then, and then under Chandragupta, under the, under the, Chandra Gupta the second, these areas are going to be absorbed, but they're never really because, you know, and so in a sense, you could say it's a shifting border because that becomes the border, but it is really this here, which is effectively the border as they see it. That is that these areas have been absorbed, but you can't really expect much tribute. So, you know, from these kings. And so when you're actually looking at the history of the Guptas, you find that cities such as, let's say, modern day Delhi, for example, all right? And you remember that Delhi had been around for a very long period of time. So when I say modern day, I mean the present site of Delhi, that's all I mean, obviously. But areas, cities such as Delhi, for example, okay? You know, you, they don't really figure into the history of the Guptas, you know? It's really this area over here and then moving into Western UP, okay? And moving north into, into the hills, which is where they had been able to forge an alliance with the Lichavis, and then somewhat down to the deck, and that is really the extremities. And on the eastern end, of course, moving into what is present day, um, you know, Northeast India, right? This is, this, by the way, would be now present day Bangladesh, where my cursor is, and then portions of Assam and Northeast India over here, right? So this is really, this is, this is what the Guptas were controlling. Um, now, what are the highlights of the Gupta Empire? Because if it's called the Golden Age, uh, we might want to consider what are some of the principal uh, achievements uh, and accomplishments. Uh, I think there is a general consensus that the Gupta emperors pursued policies of religious and political toleration. And I, I, I underscore the phrase general consensus because uh, I don't think this is simply a matter of uh, thinking along the lines of Hindu nationalists and then suggesting that, ah, we're looking for periods which were periods which would demonstrate that Hinduism was always a tolerant religion. No, I think that, I think that there is a general scholarly consensus that the Guptas were emperors who pursued religious toleration, even though, to move to the second related point, there is a revival of Hindu kingship. What that means also is that there's going to be a decline of Buddhism. But I don't think that this decline of Buddhism can be attributed to a war conducted by the Guptas against the Buddhists. I don't think that's really the case. Uh, so another way of putting this is that, and when I say revival of king, Hindu kingship, what I mean is that the, that, the, that the Guptas are going to model themselves as Hindu rulers. Uh, and they're going to rule as Hindu rulers, right? So this is this is why the the revival of Hindu kingship becomes important because remember that in the preceding centuries, particularly after the ascendancy of Ashoka, that large portions of North India are going to slowly come under under Buddhist hegemony. And I don't think it is I don't think it is an exaggeration to suggest that the Gangetic Plains was really Buddhist terrain for several centuries, predominantly Buddhist terrain. Of course, you had uh, Brahminism as well, but 
I think that this was a this was the period of Buddhist expansion, and so especially for I think for modern day Hindus, uh, although I'm suggesting at the same time to you that that's not the only view to take, that for but for modern day Hindus especially I think the the revival of Hin of Hindu kingship under the Guptas is something that that they find uh, uh, they can take pride in that this was uh, this was not only a Hindu dynasty but it was. Uh, conceivably the most important dynasty uh, in India, uh, certainly before the coming of the Mughals, certainly before the coming of the Mughals. And of course, some people, depending on their political view, might even say that the Guptas were more important than the Mughals were. Uh, popular or Puranic Hinduism comes into shape. And by that, I mean, in part, this whole Puranic literature that I've talked about. Uh, uh, you know, the, the enormous storehouse of uh, Hindu myths, uh, the lives of and, 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 uh, of Vishnu and Shiva, the goddesses, uh, you know, the thousands of stories, all of this is really coming into shape. The texts that are going to give us all of that are really coming into shape. So these, this would include what you call, would call the Puranas today, uh, of which there are a great many. Uh, and as I've suggest, suggested, at the same time, you'll find a gradual decline of Buddhism. Um, the other highlight is, and we will look at, we will look at these in somewhat greater detail, uh, but uh, the other highlight is the flowering of classical Sanskrit drama, epitomized most of all in the figure of the dramatist uh, Kalidas. Uh, so this is the heyday of Sanskrit theater. Um, and it is important, again, to mention that many of his plays are still performed, uh, including, of course, most eminently Shakuntala, but this is part of the repertoire of many theater companies down to the present day. You find significant developments in mathematics and astronomy, uh, all right? And we get some real insights into um, uh, the structure of Indian society, uh, the structure of Indian society of, uh, by looking at some of the uh, uh, the evidence um, and some of the sources that we have about uh, the Guptas. So the last unified empire, I've, I've mentioned this before, I don't need to reiterate it, is, is under Ashoka. And then if we're looking at the political history, which we went over before, that's what this does over here. It basically gives you a little idea uh, of uh, the kind of political fragmentation that I'd really spoken about the importance of the Greeks, particularly with respect to the development of the school of sculpture, you know, the Kandara school of sculpture. Uh, you have uh, modern day Pakistan, much of what is now called Kashmir, uh, all under these Greek or Bactrian armies. Uh, and you have uh, such dynasties as the Scythians, also known as the Shakas uh, and the Kushans. Uh, but all of this is beginning to disintegrate. By late 3rd century CE, the Kushans had withdrawn to West Punjab, uh, and the Shakas are still there. They're controlling Ujjain, but, they're, but the domain of their, the area of their control has really dwindled very considerably. And the early Guptas, so, you know, I said to you, the early history begins 270, 271, um, with a man known as Sri Gupta. He's ruling from Magadha, that is from that area of which Patna was, a, was the most well-known city uh, uh, and his successor, Gadkotkac, uh, Gupta, they actually both, they, they're independent rulers to a degree, right? That's why I said they're just kings among many other kings at this point in time, because they actually accept the sovereignty of the Kushans. And it's really only after Gadkotkac and Chandragupta, Chandragupta Gupta coming into place that we're going to find that the Guptas are going to um, become the, the hegemon, that is the dominant you know, power, all right? So we begin with Chandragupta the uh, first, who reigns from 319 to 335, uh, generally viewed as the founder of the Gupta empire. He describes himself in inscriptions as the Maha Raja Adi Raja, the king of kings. Uh, Sometimes when you see an inscription like this, you say to yourself, well, he must have been a very mighty person. Well, I think two things need to be said. Uh, this is a very pompous title. Uh, and we do know that there were a fair number of minor kings who took this title as well. 
all right? So we shouldn't really make much of this title. Uh, and we have to remember uh, the role of panegyrics. Panegyrics is, uh, you know, where you, where you uh, um, uh, how should I render this word? So panegyrics is, is, is uh, where you celebrate and felicitate people uh, in very pompous language. You know, uh, you know you, 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 the ambassador becomes his excellency, his most renowned excellency, his exalted, emerge, you know, um, uh, uh, graciousness, et cetera, et cetera, right? You keep on piling one title and another, panegyrics. Dictators love panegyrics, for example. So Maha Raja Adi Raja, the fact that he is described in these inscriptions or describes himself, you can't really make too much of it. Uh, it, it also suggests that he might have had pretensions to be viewed as the greatest king ever. And this is a constant, not just in Indian history, but it's a constant in history all over the world. People who give themselves glorious titles and give themselves multiple titles, all right? So he established himself at Magadha in Eastern India, forms a po political alliance with the Lichavis by marrying Kumara Devi, and both he and his queen are going to be mentioned in the pillar inscription of Samudra Gupta. So Samudra Gupta is, is his son, right? And he's, so the son is going to mention both, both his father and his mother in the inscription. And, and this is the dynasty I was referring to when I was referring to the political alliance that he's going to forge. So here is a coin uh, that I was referring to. These are gold coins. Um, they've come down to us, I think you would say, in, in pretty good shape. This, these are punch holes, which were quite common. I'm not a specialist in numismatics at all, but, but uh, you, can, you can find very elaborate websites which uh, give you good images of a lot of these coins with very detailed descriptions uh, of these coins and where they were found and their weight and their dimensions. Uh, and all of that, all right? So, but this this uh, gold coin shows uh, uh, Chandragupta the first. So the coin is from the time of Samudra Gupta, their son, who reigned from, who reigned, whose reign was very long, in fact. Uh, and, and then this is his uh, consort, his wife, uh, uh, Queen Kumara Devi, who, who, who was from the Lichavi clan, all right? So uh, this is, I think a very good illustration of, of what I meant when I talked about the gold coins. Um, I want to just uh, also look very briefly at some of the other developments and then we'll take a more detailed look at, at, at Kalidas, uh, at uh, 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 Samudra Gupta's inscription on the pillar and a number of other artifacts from Gupta history. So you have very considerable developments in linguistics. Uh, in India at this time. Uh, there is a Sanskrit grammar written by Panini. Uh, I mention it at this point rather than we were when we were looking at the fourth century. Uh, this grammar actually dates back to the fourth century BCE. So uh, this is um, really uh, a grammar written which is, I mean, uh, composed, you know, roughly a hundred years perhaps before the time of uh, Ashoka. Right, and fourth century BCE for a grammar of this kind is is a very early date. Uh, so it's a, it's what's called a generative and descriptive grammar, and it needs to be said that even today, students of linguistics all over the world take this text very seriously as an illustration of what a grammar of a language should be like. Uh, uh, Panini's, uh, the uh, Panini, uh, 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 you know, uh, is going to write this in sutras and aphorisms, and then you have to interpret what each of these and recall what has been mentioned on many uh, previous occasions, and that's one reason why we are looking at it now rather than at that point in time. That most of these texts, including the theological texts religious texts are always read with commentaries. You know, so for example, if, if we, you know, if I was being trained as a Sanskrit Pandit, uh, or even if I was being trained in Sanskrit as a modern scholar, 
uh, of Sanskrit and of ancient Indian history and, and, and literature. Uh, when I read the Upanishads, I read it with the commentary. It, it may, may very often be the commentary of Shankaracharya, uh, you know, from uh, the eighth century. Uh, it may be a commentary of someone belonging to a different school of thought, but it would be usually read with a commentary. And, and this Panini Sanskrit grammar would have been uh, read uh, with a commentary. So it's actually read through Patanjali's Mahabhasha, which is another great work dating back to the second century BCE. But the reason why we look at it this time is because it is around this time that these texts come down to us in some kind of coherent form. Uh, and remember that we don't have manuscripts which go back to 4th century BCE. We, the, the, the dating is really done on the basis of the language that is used, the references in the text. If someone is citing somebody and we know that that work existed earlier, uh, you know, then you can, you can make certain inferences about when to date this particular work. Uh, and one modern scholar has said that Panini's theory of morphological analysis was more advanced than any equivalent Western theory before the 20th century. So what we have here is, and this is, this is all, of course, leading to this idea of the Guptas as the golden age, because now I'm saying to you, it's not simply this idea of a unified India, a Hindu kingdom. It does have to do with some other achievements and various domains which are quite different. So literature, you get, you get Kalidas, you, and in the theological world, you get the Puranas coming into shape here, right? And then, and then you get works of mathematics, astronomy, linguistics, right? Now, Samudra Gupta 335 to 375, um, uh, and in about 10, 15 minutes, I'll pause to see if you have any questions before we take up the rest of it. But Samudra Gupta rules from 335 to 375. So we're talking about a very long reign. We're talking about a reign of 40 years. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a reign uh, which uh, equals a reign really of the other great monarchs of Indian history. Uh, it's a bit longer than the reign of Ashoka, uh, moving much, you know, moving to a much more recent, comparatively recent time. It's, it's almost comparable to the reigns of uh, Akbar and, and Aurangzeb. Uh, 40 years is, is really a very long uh, time to rule. Uh, so Samudra Gupta is, uh, uh, it, it, the name signifies someone who's protected by the sea. The sea is up to where his dominion extends uh, and the inscription refers to him as, and then you have this long Sanskrit compound, which means the fame of his conquests extended up to the four oceans. Uh, at this moment, it may be worthwhile just, just going back to this map here for a second because if you look at this map over here, it suggests to you uh, uh, that Samudra Gupta had encompassed uh, a, a large areas uh, which, which now al lie along the coast, right? So the four oceans here is not meant to be taken literally, of course, because there are no four, four oceans. Uh, it is possible, by the way, that, that Samudra Gupta maybe may have come as far as a tip uh, of India come to the tip over here. The, it certainly was not absorbed into his empire uh, and therefore would have seen here both the what then subsequently becomes known as the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea and of course the Indian Ocean down here. Uh, but, but it's to be meant to be read more, the inscription is meant to be read more liberally as someone who had really expanded his conquests so that it touched the waters. Uh, and this is where we go back to my ob earlier observation that that when you really look at Indian empires, these have been largely land-based empires. Uh, uh, and Samudra Gupta himself, uh, uh, there is no evidence to suggest that he ever had a, ever had a navy, you know, ever had a, uh, ever had a navy. So the, 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 uh, the exploits uh, taken to the sea and he's able to retain those kingdoms for a period of time, uh, but we're not talking about a naval power at this point uh, in time. And R.C. Majumdar then describes to you the extent uh, of the empire. Uh, and, and when he refers to Sindh and Gujarat, then what he's referring to here is once again, the ocean there, okay? The, the sea over there. Um, 
the, so the main sources for the study of Sakunthar Gupta are the are gold coins and the inscription on the Ashokan pillar, uh, which has been mentioned a number of times. Let me turn to that pillar uh, over here. This is the pillar. Uh, this pillar should be familiar to you. Uh, we saw it before. It's the Ashokan pillar from the time, therefore, of Ashoka uh, in Allahabad. Uh, and what is remarkable is that several centuries later, Samudra Gupta is going to have an inscription carved on this pillar. And a millennium later, more than a millennium later, more than, oh, let's say we're talking about 1200 years later, more than 1200 years later, the Emperor Jahangir is going to have an inscription carved on the same pillar. Now, you see, I think we have to interpret the significance of that before we even get to the subject matter of the pillar. Because you see, in a sense, I had, I had argued and I, and I stand by what I had said, that what is interesting is that when you look at Ashoka, you don't find any references okay, to him for centuries thereafter. Right? And, and then if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking, for example, at the five centuries before the discovery, as it's called, of these European pillars, uh, these Ashokan pillars, sorry, uh, by the Europeans. And when Jane Princip deciphered the script, remember? Okay, we're talking about the 1830s here. That for centuries preceding that, there is really no mention of Ashoka anywhere at all. Not whatsoever. But the pillars were there. Okay, so the pillars are there. They're being, they were scattered throughout parts of the empire. And these are very very conspicuous pillars, particularly when we are talking about pre-modern times, you know, when there would have been relatively few buildings to mar the landscape, you wouldn't have had skyscrapers. Yes, you had some majestic buildings, but those were few and far between, right? So now, why does Samudra Gupta carve a pillar, a carve an inscription on this pillar? Well, the most obvious answer, but it's not a very satisfactory or very political answer is because, well, this was, this was a very conspicuous pillar. And when he carves the inscription on the pillar, it becomes public property because when, when, you, when it's a pillar standing in a public space, people can come and they can read the inscription. All right, they can read the inscription. So you could say that he did it for the most obvious reason that this was a way to make known his views. But the other more interesting argument really is that every great sovereign wants to legitimize himself by invoking the legacy of some previous sovereign. Even modern politicians do that all the time. You know, if Mr. Trump wants to be known, he will be known for all the the rotten things that have happened, but that's a different matter. But he would like to be known, what? As someone who has inherited the legacy of the founding fathers, Jefferson, Washington. He would like to think of, he likes to think of himself as a modern day Andrew Jackson, one of the, you know, the president who appears, I think if I remember correctly on the $20 bill, you know, all right? So, uh, or whichever denomination it is, but, you know, an American president who is well known. So this is what is really happening here, that you legitimize your rule and you, you gain, you, you claim uh, that you are in the footsteps of someone as great as Ashoka. Okay, that, that's really what Samudra Gupta is doing. And this is what the Mughal emperor is doing 1200 years later. Jahangir, because he puts an inscription on the same pillar, on the very same pillar. So that, you know, when, when someone went to read the pillar, they, they begin to understand, oh, this goes back to the time of Ashoka, and then you have some other Gupta, and now Jahangir. So it's as though Jahangir is, in, is, is inherited the political legacy of these two great rulers from the past. All right, this is, this is what's really happening over here. Uh, I wanted to actually share with you the, the text 
which I thought I'd put here, but okay, uh, I'll, I think it's in a different document. Um, but uh, the text of this, the text of this pillar, uh, but it doesn't really matter because I'll explain to you what the text of the, the text of the inscription is. So one of the things that Samadhar Gupta is doing is that he is renewing these old Hindu notions of kingship. I've suggested that. Um, the pill, what does the pillar say, by the way? And also what the pillar does is it describes basically all his conquests, right? Which are the areas that he has absorbed, right? He has absorbed, you know, the, the entire Eastern coast, uh, uh, the region, you know, of, of, uh, of Orissa or Kalinga, as it was known at the time of uh, Ashoka, large portions of the Deccan, right? It enumerates all the names of all the kingdoms who became subservient to him. That's what it does, all right? And, and again, we have to interpret that a little bit because, because we cannot assume that he, that he ruled these areas directly all the time, okay? In other words, what we can assume is that all of these kings he subdued, whom he defeated in battle, are kings who are going to pay tribute to him. They're going to pay tribute. So tribute was a sum of money that you would send, you know, at regular intervals, however they were determined by the two parties. So it's, 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 it's a way that in, in which the defeated king renders homage and acknowledges the superiority of the person to whom he's rending the revenue, all right? That's what we can assume these conquests really meant. And <clears throat> what he's going to do is he's going to revive this old horse sacrifice, which goes back to the Vedic period. And if you remember the Ramayan story, you know, it is actually the, this Ashwamedha sacrifice that was carried out by Ram um, and some versions of the Ram Katha, the, the horse sacrifice, the Ashwamedha that was carried out where the horse comes up to the, to the ashram of Love and Kush and then Love and Kush who are the sons of Ram will actually engage Lakshman in battle uh, and subsequently almost their father without realizing that he is their father when Ram himself comes, right? But that was the horse sacrifice called Ashwamedha. So this was, this is the way, this is the sacrifice that goes back to the Vedic days. And the revival of this ceremony uh, indicated once again, the return of what we might describe as a period of Vedic slash Hindu, okay, hegemony. This is what, this is what is really signified. So, you know, this, this celebration of what is called these round of conquest, that's a dig Vijay, uh, is undertaken through the Ashwamedha for sacrifice. So he establishes a system of direct rule where you have places such as Bengal, Bihar, UP, Northern Madhya Pradesh, I'm now using the modern terms for these areas. And then you have this indirect rule that is the areas where the, where the, the rulers are paying tribute to him, uh, 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 offering obeisance, rituals of obeisance to him uh, and where the kings of these defeated areas, which he's ruling indirectly, uh, a, will agree to give their daughters into marriage into members of the royal family. Okay, all right. So, so you can distinguish the conquest, which from uh, you know the conquest in Aryabharth. The Aryabharth is the heartland, the inner core, uh, 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 from those which take place in southern India, which is the Dakshin. Dakshina path. Dakshina means south. Path is path, right? Uh, and then the neighboring states such as Nepal, which of course had also been absorbed to a great degree through the marriage alliance. And then in outlying areas such as the island of Ceylon, which the evidence seems to suggest came under the, the rule of the, the Guptas. All right. So this is essentially what is really transpiring uh, at this time. I give you another map here once again now to refresh your memories because here this is, and all of these are different maps because cartography is interesting too, how one thinks about it. Different cartographers think of different ways in which they want to draw up uh, the map to, to reflect a kind of argument they're interested in. And so here, this is the core region that we've spoken about. I've used that word before. This is the outer boundaries of the Guptas. These are the Vakatakas. That is that they have forged an alliance, but they're not going to rule there, right? 
because uh, of course the advantage of forging an alliance but not ruling is that you get the benefits of security but don't pay the price for security because if you're going to secure it in your kingdom right and you're going to absorb it in your kingdom well then you need to have an army there and you need to protect it but but this way he doesn't have they don't have to protect it but they're not threatened by them because they're allies the Vakatakas. all right and then this is the outer boundaries which are sort of you know at times they're in the gupta empire at times they're not it depends because obviously the empire is going to diminish once you get uh, later into you know the 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 400s uh, all right so it's called the western satraps uh, and and these here are kingdoms down here further down south here which are not absorbed uh, into uh, the guptas at all so this is the ashokan pillar i spoke about uh, here you have a gold coin from the reign of Samudra Gupta uh, with the image of uh, uh, Garuda. This is this is the Garuda, the bird, right? Uh, you can see the wings over here. Um, and these, uh, I don't know what the precise uh, gold content is uh, here because, as I said, uh, during the reign of Samudra Gupta, uh, the gold content actually diminishes. Uh, and, and again, different coins may reflect a different uh, composition uh, the that is the exact percentage of gold uh, as opposed to uh, copper for example may may vary all right uh, and that's where you would have to really uh, be a specialist in numismatics to get into more details about about that uh, i i show this not because this is a a painting obviously from the gupta period this is the this is the great late 19th century uh, artist uh, who plays an iconic role in the development of certain strands of modern Indian art, Raja Ravi Verma. Uh, but I show this because this Garuda that I'm speaking about here, this is a representation by a late 19th century uh, uh, artist. Uh, and here you see Vishnu astride uh, Garuda. All right. Uh, and here you have another gold dinar. Notice the word dinar here. This, is, this word is still used for coinage uh, in several countries in the Middle East. Uh, including Iraq. Uh, the word dinar actually goes back to the Kushans. Okay, it goes back to the Kushans, uh, who were the ruling dynasty in India in the first century uh, of the common era. And, and in this case, I have a little note which, which, uh, which gives me the details that this gold coin weighs 7.85 grams. That's a very heavy gold coin. If you think about it, right? 7.85 grams, its diameter is 20 meters. Uh, there are some other interesting uh, features to this gold coin that we need to just very briefly look at. The king is seated on a couch. He's playing the veena. Now that's very interesting. The veena is a musical instrument. So one of the things it may suggest to us is that this was a king who was quite accomplished. Uh, he was not simply a person who uh, uh, excelled in political statecraft right and was a great patron uh, of the arts but that he himself was an accomplished artist however it is possible that the coin may be like by which i mean simply this that much as you have this kind of panegyrics that i was speaking about right where the king is going to know you know maha adi raja raja the king of kings the king king of kings you know you multiply right these panegyrics his exalted Highness, etc. Well, one of the ways in which you promote a certain idea of a king who is a great figure and who's ecumenical and he's broad minded is you show him playing the veena, you show him playing an instrument. This doesn't establish the fact that he knew how to play the veena or that he was an accomplished player of the veena. What veena, what it does establish is that there was some cultural capital in being known as someone who could play the veena. That is, you earn some credit. People think of you as enlightened. And, and whoever, whoever, whoever crafted the coins, you know, with, with, his, with the king's own permission, obviously did so with the understanding that this representation was, a king, was the representation that the king himself wanted. We cannot infer from this that he was actually a competent player or if at all a player of the veena himself. All right, Lakshmi here is seated. So this is the other side of the coin, is seated on a stool holding a diadem. Um, 
uh, the, the here you see uh, let me see where uh, th this 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 here is a is a uh, inscription uh, i don't know the language so i'm actually relying upon uh, the translation here uh, and the the according to the notes that i read this inscription actually gives his name here and says some of their gupta all right so this is this is i think if you see the coin you would agree that the work of craftsmanship on this coin is is really you know very superior i mean you're talking about really extremely good uh, craftsmanship here and i may have uh, one or two more no this is the last example i have so i think that what i'd like to do at this point because we've covered a fair bit of terrain is to uh, 